Welcome back to Introduction to Philosophy. Uh, today we're going to be talking about philosophy of science. And so, just kind of kicking things off, uh, what's science? So, well, first of all, the word science comes from the Latin word scientia, and it means knowledge. And so when you're talking about science, when you're talking about uh, that scientia, you're talking about trying to acquire some type of knowledge. Uh, and in this case, knowledge of the physical world. Remember us talking about that there were two kinds of knowledge uh, in the Greek language. One was gnosko, and that's a, a kind of a heart knowledge. And then there's also epistemi, which is where we get the word epistemology, and that's the study of head knowledge. And so scientia, in this case, is going to be the study of the, that physical world around us. And so what criteria might um, be used in order for something to be called science? Well, today we have what's called the scientific method, and it basically looks like this, observation, hypothesis, prediction, experimentation and conclusion. I'm not going to go into depth on that. I expect most of you have been introduced to the scientific method. If you haven't, that's a job for your science class, but that's what we use today basically to determine that something is good science or bad science, uh, a good conclusion or a bad conclusion. Uh, in science, in the philosophy of science, but now talking about the use of how does uh, science function. So in this case, when we're, if we're talking about the philosophy of science, we're talking about how it, um, how it functions, what's their basic ideology, how do they try to move forward, right? They use two things. They use one thing that's called deductive reasoning. And deductive reasoning is the process by which a person makes conclusions based on previously known facts. And so you get some kind of a fact, and then you uh, reach some new fact, and you reach some new fact until eventually what happens is Either a first principle is established or some type of theory is established. Uh, and in that case, um, when it comes to using deductive reasoning, uh, when you do this, if you can deduce something, like if you can lay out, remember us talking in logic, that premise, premise, conclusion. With deductive reasoning, it, uh, it uses that type of uh, understanding so that if premise A is true and premise B is true and they, they correlate with each other, then you know, the conclusion is also true. And so in this case, deductive reasoning in science is very useful. It can give us things like bugs with three body parts and six legs are insects. A gadfly has three, parts, three body parts and six legs, therefore a gadfly is an insect. And so that type of deductive reasoning is very, very useful. Again, premise, bugs with three body parts and six legs are insects. Premise two, a gadfly has three body parts and six legs. And your conclusion, therefore, is that a gadfly is an insect. Very, very useful. Uh, science does that constantly. It does that all the time as it observes, observes the natural world around us. Uh, that, that's one of its main functions. It's not the only one, but it's a very, very useful one. It's very powerful. Another example of a deductive argument. If your temperature is greater than 100.4, you have a fever. Your temperature is 102.5, which means you, know, you have a fever. If the science has said if your body temperature exceeds 100.4, we'll say your temperature is high enough that we say you've got that fever. If your temperature is 102.5, therefore, according to deductive reasoning, you have a fever. As we say, very, very useful, uh, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, we use it constantly in, in science as we observe and experiment and make conclusions. That's deductive reasoning, premise, premise, conclusion. Inductive reasoning is a little more complicated, and so go a little bit more slowly here. But in, inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is the process of arriving at a conclusion based on a set of observations. It, is self, it itself is not a valid proof. Uh, it is the nature of induction that the conclusion of an inductive argument is never proved absolutely. We accept it with a great degree of probability. It's most likely, it's highly probable. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. And in fact, you can't you can't prove something using inductive knowledge, but you have to use inductive knowledge all the time, every day, in order to successfully navigate the world around us. You have to do it. Let me give you an example of something that you, you can't be certain about. Um, 
uh, you can't be certain that the sun will rise tomorrow. That's something that you have to accept as most probable. You can't prove that it will happen. It's nothing that you can do. Uh, in fact, you can't prove that the sun existed eight minutes ago because it takes eight minutes for light from the sun to get to our planet, which means that seven minutes ago, an alien spaceship that uses stars, our sun, is going to use it for a battery. You know, their battery is dying. They popped out of a wormhole. They grabbed our sun, and then they jumped back into another wormhole with a fresh battery in their spaceship. You can't know that that didn't happen for eight minutes because it takes eight minutes for light to get there. So you can't even prove that the sun won't be there seven minutes from now. I mean, we could sit here and wait for eight minutes, and well, if it's still there, it didn't happen, and if it's not, uh, then, you know, well, that's one theory of what happened to the sun if it's gone. But you can't prove it. You just have to accept with a large degree of probability that the sun will, in fact, rise tomorrow. Now, is it more likely that the sun will rise tomorrow or that it won't rise tomorrow? Well, it's been doing it for how many ever millions of years that anybody knows about. And so since the sun has done this for so long, it seems most reasonable to believe that it will continue to do it, but you can't prove it. You just have to accept it with a large degree of probability. And science does this a lot. Now, they use deductive arguments a lot where the conclusion is proven. It's conclusive, and it's just shown. But it does a lot of inductive reasoning as well, so that it's not necessarily proven, it's just what's most likely. It's, say, the best working theory at the time, or it's just the thing that we have to accept as, well, chances are this is the way it's going to work. And so, you know, another example, I mean, again, we, we do this all the time. If you walk outside in the morning and you put your key in your car and you turn the key and try to start the engine, and the engine doesn't start, it just doesn't do anything, it doesn't even, you know, maybe it just kind of grunts a little bit or something, you don't assume that the laws of nature that are in charge of how gas combusts, you, you wouldn't assume that those laws have changed, have changed so that now gas doesn't combust, and say, for example, maybe water now combusts, you wouldn't say, hmm, I think what's wrong with my car is that the laws of nature have changed so that now I need to put water in my car in order for it to have combustion for it to move and now I need to put gas into myself, I suppose, to rehydrate myself as, as opposed to what I do with water. Now, you wouldn't make that assumption. Why not? Because it, it's not very probable. What's most probable is that, you know, your starter's gone out or I mean, your battery's dead or, you know, you... There's any number of things that could be wrong with your car, but you're probably not going to jump straight to the laws of nature have changed. That's pretty improbable. And so, like I say, we use induction all the time. And in fact, um, we use the laws, uh, we use uh, inductive reasoning, even in simple, I mean, really practical, not, you know, suns disappearing and cars failing to start. Even things like, um, I, I walked in here today, I knew I was going to be doing this lecture. Uh, I set up all of my apparatus here. I pulled up the chair that I wanted to sit in, and I just plopped myself down right in that chair. I didn't think about the fact that the chair could collapse. I mean, inductively, I just made the assumption. I thought it's more probable that the chair won't collapse than that the chair will collapse. So did I know deductively that the chair wouldn't collapse? No, no, because chairs do collapse. I have seen them collapse. I know that they can fail structurally so that they would not support my weight and so that they would in fact collapse. That's entirely possible, but inductively I just kind of reasoned, well, it doesn't happen often. I've sat in this chair before. It's not like there was an elephant in here earlier and I had to worry that perhaps the structure of the chair is no longer sound because the elephant has, you know, harmed the chair in some way. And so I just plopped down and inductively thought, you know, it's probably going to hold me. So we use induction all the time. Scientists use induction all the time. We make the difference. Uh, we, d we make the, the distinction uh, between these two types of reasoning so that we understand that, you know, science uses this. Science uses this as well. 
Uh, and both of them are useful, both of them are necessary, both of them, frankly, are unavoidable, uh, and so we use them. All right. With induction, um, there were lots of people who were made nervous by the fact that they can't prove that the sun won't rise tomorrow or that gravity won't turn itself off so that everything on our planet perhaps just floats away. Uh, we can't prove that. We can't know that. And some people were upset and they were disturbed by this. Uh, and along comes finally a fellow by the name of Karl Popper, and he gives us something that's called falsification. And in falsification, basically what he's saying is that you're logical, you're rational to continue to believe things like you know, the sun will rise tomorrow uh, until we're given some type of evidence to the contrary. So it's perfectly rational for you to believe that the chair is going to support your weight until you know maybe that particular chair chair fails you, or until all chairs like that maybe fail you. You know, if there's a massive automobile recall because some something in an automobile, a certain automobile keeps breaking down, well, until that happens, until that that particular automobile type you know, shows that weakness, it's perfectly rational to continue to believe that your automobile will function properly uh, until evidence is brought to the contrary. So the sun will continue to rise. Why? Because it's always done it. And until that theory of the sun will rise tomorrow, until that theory is proven false, then we're perfectly justified in our belief that it will continue to do so. And so falsification. We need evidence that would show that the sun won't rise tomorrow. And until that happens, Popper says, perfectly logical to continue to believe that it will continue to rise. And that's very, very true. But that contribution from Karl Popper was important just to kind of settle the matter of, no, we can't prove it, but it's logical, it's rational to continue to believe the sun will rise. All right, so in philosophy, I'm sorry, in uh, science, um, they do use deductive and inductive reason uh, constantly, but they don't use them necessarily separately. It's not like you just use deductive over here and inductive over here. You often use both of them together in order to find um, some type of truth, some type of scientific uh, uh, evidence or some type of something that will help us progress and move forward. A really, really good example of both the, the use of inductive and deductive reason come, inductive reasoning comes to us from a fellow by the name of Edward Jenner. Now, if you're not familiar with Jenner, I'll give you kind of a quick background on this. Uh, in Jenner's day, uh, smallpox was sweeping across Europe and it was killing um, high percentages of the population. And if you've ever seen a smallpox victim, you will see that they are someone who is covered, uh, I mean, literally in this case, head to toe, all over their arms and all over all of their appendages. Um, some people do survive. Most people are going to die, but some people do survive. If you do survive, because the disease is so, um, uh, because it, uh, it, it harms your body so much and because it covers your body so much, uh, one, if you do recover from it, you are still going to have pockmark scars all over you. Your body's just going to be covered in scars. It's going to kill most people, but if you do survive, you're just going to be pockmarked um, from head to toe. And so what happens here is that, uh, somewhat ironically, it's not the scientists who figured this out. It's, uh, it was uh, the milkmaids who began to understand that all of these people in Europe are being infected with smallpox and dying, but the milkmaids began looking around and realizing that they were not being infected and they were not dying. And so imagine that you, know, you are a milkmaid and you come home from work and your husband is um, a carpenter and you look at your husband and, he, you know, how, honey, how was, you know, how was work today? And he said, oh, you know, Joe, he, over, you know, he, he got smallpox and he died today. And then, you know, you go to <clears throat> the market to get some food for your family that night, and you're talking to the grocer, and the grocer says, oh, you know, my grocer friend over here, uh, they got smallpox and, and they died today. And you go to, you know, the bank, and you talk to the banker, and the banker says, you know, this banker guy over here, he got smallpox and he died today, and then your plumbing breaks, you bring in your plumber, and the plumber says, oh, you know, you know, my plumber friend, he got... After you start seeing all these people in other occupations over periods of time who are getting smallpox and dying, and then you go to work the next day, 
and you sit down on your little milking stool and you're talking to the other milkmaids and you say to them, milkmaids aren't dying. All these people and all these other occupations are dying. We're not. Why aren't, why aren't we getting smallpox? Why aren't we dying? Everybody else is losing people in our occupations. They're losing loved ones. We're not. And so what happens is that the milkmaids finally figure out that when they milk a cow, they get a little bacteria on their hands, and they have little bitty pox, just like smallpox, but in this case, they get what's called cowpox, because a cow udder has a bacteria on it, and so when they milk the cow, they get those bacteria on their hands and they get a pox. But they figured out that if they got, small, they, if they got cowpox, they wouldn't get smallpox. None of them are dying. None of them are getting sick. And their conclusion was, as they looked around, was, hey, we're got, we have cowpox, therefore we're not going to get smallpox. And so here it is in a deductive argument. I sh uh, it says, I have had cowpox. Anyone who has cowpox will not get smallpox, therefore I will never have smallpox. And so Jenner actually overheard one of the milkmaids say, I shall never have smallpox, for I've had cowpox. I shall never have an ugly pox-marked face. And so, uh, Jenner says, well, you know, hey, the milkmaids aren't getting sick. And so he figures out that if people get cowpox, then they won't have smallpox. So he takes a little boy, and he gives the boy cowpox. No problem there, right? You give the boy cowpox. They just get some pox on their hand. It's not a big deal. He gives the boy cowpox. And then he takes smallpox, like a the boil, lances it, puts, he gives somebody, that, that same boy, he gives him smallpox, and the boy doesn't get sick. And from this, we have vaccinations. This is where vaccines come from. And it's this idea of we use both deductive knowledge and we use inductive knowledge together in order to make scientific dis discoveries. And then, in this case, Jenner is going to invent vaccines. He's going to invent vaccinations. Now, uh, certainly science uses uh, um, uh, deductive and inductive reasoning, but we have to be careful. Um, and, uh, you know, usually as I'm talking about the whole Jenner gives the kid cowpox, I'm like, no problem. And then Jenner gives him smallpox, and I say, not my son. You know, give him my son smallpox, and go find somebody else's son to experiment on here, because I know about something called causation versus correlation. And causation, causation versus correlation is kind of that tricky thing in science where you have something, you have these two events that they, they correlate, meaning that they happen within the same kind of time frame and even within the same, uh, within the same uh, area of space. And so time and space, they kind of happen, and it makes them look like one is causing the other, but in fact, it isn't the cause, it's just that they are correlating. They're not causing, there's just correlation. And so, for example, um, malaria. Um, a literal translation of the word malaria is two words. It means bad air. Mal, meaning bad, like malpractice means bad practice. And then area just means air. And originally, people thought that uh, that. Um, the reason people get malaria is because of the bad air like in a low-lying swampy type of area so for example in, when we were digging the Panama Canal you know we're digging across there through this kind of tropical jungle type atmosphere and there's lots of low-lying swampy area and so the workers were getting bad air disease those workers would get into the swamp They'd just be working in there to build this, uh, the Panama Canal, uh, and they'd breathe too much of that bad air, that swampy, you know, damp, awful air, and then they'd get sick. So what they would do in order to combat bad air disease is they would take them out and they'd send them off to the mountains where the air was nice and clean and not moist and not damp. And so they thought that it was the bad air that these people were breathing, when in fact today we know that it was a mosquito. And so malaria bad air disease comes to us through mosquito bites. Well, where do mosquitoes live? They live in swampy, low-lying, uh, very humid 
areas like swamps. That's where they like to dwell. Do they like to live up in, you know, dry, mountainous? No, no. Not a lot of mosquitoes up there in that dry mountain air. Plenty of them in the swamps. And so what was happening there was that there was a kind of correlation between this idea of bad air, swampy air, and that disease that they thought came from the bad air, when in fact the swampy air was not the cause of the disease. There was correlation, same time, same space, it correlated, but it was not caused by the bad air. And so it's hard a lot of times to see uh, through causation versus correlation. And often what will happen is that later on, science will come up with some kind of new knowledge and then we'll figure out, hey, it wasn't that to begin with. It was actually this. So another example of that. Um, in the 1980s in Time Magazine, the cover uh, was a picture of two eggs on a plate. Um, and then, you know, kind of a droopy looking uh, two eggs, like as they were droopy eyes, and then underneath was a strip of bacon, like in a, in a frowny face, not a smiley face, in a frowny face. Uh, and it said, uh, eggs, you know, cholesterol, now the bad news. Uh, and the idea here was that eggs were bad for you because they're high in cholesterol, so if you have high cholesterol and you eat eggs, you'll have higher cholesterol, and that's bad, so you have to stop eating, e eating eggs. And for a long time, uh, that was believed to be true, but later science figured out that there is in fact different kinds of cholesterol, and some cholesterol is good and some cholesterol is bad, and in this case, eggs cholesterol is really good. It's, you want to be high in that particular kind of cholesterol. Now, let me also just say there, if your doctor has recommended or told you to stop eating eggs, stop eating eggs, right? I'm not a doctor. I'm not telling you just ignore their advice. What I'm saying is that in the 1980s, there was correlation, not causation, between eating eggs and high cholesterol. And so, in this case, uh, the eggs kind of cholesterol is a good cholesterol, right? So, you know, now we know that the eggs cholesterol is good, and so we don't stop eating eggs if we have high cholesterol necessarily. Again, if your doctor told you not to, don't do it. But, in this case, you know, it's a different kind of cholesterol. We learn something else, we learn something new, and then we understand that it was correlating, it wasn't causing, the eggs weren't causing the high cholesterol. So eggs are in fact, you know, good for you, I eat tons of eggs. Um, I also, I, I like to tell my students there, because I've got this picture of that plate with the eggs and the bacon, you know, that's frowning and, you know, eggs, now the bad news. And so I defend eggs and I tell them, you know, eggs are actually, you know, they're high in good cholesterol, so, you know, eggs are good for you. Uh, and then I tell them that bacon is also good for you. And then there's this nice little kind of quiet that falls across the room. And then I tell them, it's good for you because it makes you happy. And, uh, well, darn it. They were really hoping for some kind of, you know, health. Hey, this is good. Yeah, it's not. It's, it's not. It makes you happy, and that might be good. But I'm sorry, I don't know of any redemptive, uh, healthy powers for bacon. You're just kind of out of luck on that one. Okay. All right, so that kind of causation versus correlation, we have to be careful with it. I've got a doctor friend here in uh, Fort Smith who gave me an article and told me a story. Um, in 2002, JAMA, J-A-M-A, JAMA, it's a medical uh, journal, came out with a study that showed that women who breastfeed their babies uh, have more intelligent babies than women who don't breastfeed their babies, right? And so this was in 2002. She knew about causation versus correlation. She wasn't sure that it was true. Uh, she just kind of waited and said, yeah, I'm not sure we need more study. Sure enough, a couple years later, more studies come out. What they find is that, yes, women who breastfeed their babies tend to have more intelligent babies than women who uh, bottle feed, formula feed their babies, but it had nothing to do with the, the intelligence of the child, had nothing to do with breast milk versus bottle milk and it had everything to do with the educational level of the mother who was feeding the child because intelligent, educated women know, have learned, that breast milk is healthier for their babies than bottle milk, and so they tend to breastfeed. Why? Because they've done research into motherhood, and raising healthy kids, and all these things. The higher your education level, the more likely you are to know this. Women over here know this. As it turns out, if you're, an, if you're educated, and if you're an intellectual, and you uh, and you have kids, guess what you do with your kids? You have intelligent conversations with your children 
which means that their brain is going to formulate in more intelligent ways. It's going to make connections in the brain uh, that perhaps people who just plop their child down in front of SpongeBob SquarePants and don't have intelligent conversations with their kids, their brains are not going to formulate in the same way. And so you're going to have this, uh, this type of causation where it's not the milk that you're feeding them, it's the conversations that you're having with your children. So if you want to have an intelligent child, have intelligent conversations with them. If you don't care about having an intelligent child, you don't care if they're you know, kind of spastic and all over the place, let them watch SpongeBob because that's what he is, and they'll learn that spastic type of, uh, of behavior versus an intelligent conversation type of child. It's really all about the, the child and how you uh, are approaching them as an intellectual. As it turns out, this doctor woman that, that was telling me the story, uh, she graduated, I think, from Arizona. Uh, That's where she got her medical degree. She graduated third in her class. As it turns out, um, her mother uh, did not breastfeed her. Her mother bottle fed her because of health like complications, concerns. And so she, when she found this, originally found this JAMA uh, article, she took it to her mom and said, look, only, if only you had, had breastfed me, think of how intelligent I could have been. And she was kidding, of course, because she knows that it was really about the intellectual conversation. As it turns out, her father was a very, very well-known heart surgeon, and he had tons of intelligent conversation with her. And in fact, she would accompany her father to the hospital uh, as he was making his rounds, and she would, uh, she accompanied him, she learned the business, the, the medical business, and often the nurses would bring to her when she was 10, 12 years old, they would bring her father's um, uh, like diagnosis the, and the prescriptions that he wanted filled. They'd bring those to her because they couldn't read his handwriting, but she saw his handwriting so much that she could read it, and so she's raised in a highly intelligent and intellectual environment, uh, and so she is an intelligent child, not because of breast milk versus bottle milk, but just because she's raised in an intelligent environment. So causation versus correlation, uh, it's important that as you're reading anything about science, you, um, you're listening to, to science scientists who are talking, that you understand the difference in uh, deductive and inductive reasoning and causation and correlation, that way you can identify um, you know, when they're using which particular type of, of knowledge or process or whatever. Uh, it's an important distinction uh, to know. All right. Um, oh, one of the things that's also important to know about science um, is to know that scientists are human and they make mistakes just like all humans make mistakes. Science itself is pure. Scientists are not pure. They're human, so they make mistakes. One of the really famous stories that, that comes to us um, comes by, <clears throat> by way of uh, a guy by the name of uh, Ignatius Samuelweiss. And Samuelweiss uh, was a surgeon. Uh, I, sh I should explain that in that day and time, uh, doctors, surgeons, they, they might spend two weeks in a hospital, uh, and in this case, helping women uh, to deliver babies. And then for another two weeks, they would go into um, to, to another place and they would um, work on cadavers. And so during the two weeks that they were gone from the hospital, midwives would uh, give would help any woman who's giving birth. Um, and then the doctors would come back to the hospital for two weeks and they would be helping with the delivery of babies. And then they'd go back over here and they would work on their cadavers for two weeks. And so this kind of back and forth type thing. Uh, as it turns out, um, the death rate of a mother and a child was significantly higher, like in the 90s, for when uh, the doctors were in the hospital helping to deliver babies. And when there was no doctors there helping deliver the babies, the death rate dropped. I mean, it plummeted. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said that it was 90% when the doctor was there. That's incorrect. Uh, it was more like in the 50s, 60s range when the doctor was there. There was a, not a 90% death rate of the mother and child. 
But when the doctor was gone and the midwife was delivering, now there was like a 90% um, life rate for the mother and the child. And so this mother-child uh, life rate was much higher in the 90s when the midwife was delivering, and it was much lower when the doctor was delivering. Oh, yeah, I screwed that up. There you go. Um, and so the, the people, the, the midwives, concluded that men had no business uh, helping to deliver babies. That was their conclusion. You know, men should just stay over there. This is women's business. Birthing children is, you know, it's women's, women's work and just, you know, men should stay out of it. Um, Samuel Weiss uh, eventually developed this theory and he put it into practice. He said, uh, after I've worked on cadavers, I'm going to wash all of my tools and I'm going to demand that all of anyone who's working with me and, and, and myself, we're all going to wash our hands. We're going to scrub everything down before we go back and start giving birth, uh, helping these women to give birth. And wouldn't you know it, uh, when they started washing their tools after working on cadavers in their hands, and they went back over to the hospital and they started helping women give birth, uh, the, their numbers, uh, their death rate uh, increased uh, and their life rate, there I go again, their life rate increased and it matched the life rate, uh, the life rate of the midwives. There was, no, there was no difference. And so what Samuel White finally came to the conclusion of was that there must be some type of uh, microscopic, something so small on, on these tools when we work on cadavers uh, that when we come back somehow we're, we're bringing that back and it's, it's hurting, it's killing the mother or it's killing the children uh, who are in this birthing process. And he developed what we today call the germ theory of disease. But at his time, during his time, the other doctors uh, ignored the life rate that had gone up uh, and matched the midwives. They ignored it and they even kind of blackballed them. They kind of drummed them out of business and they refused to wash their hands. They refused to wash their tools and they made fun of the idea that something so small over here that you couldn't see it was actually killing a person you know over here in that hospital and they refused to accept uh, this germ theory of disease now you know later and obviously today we do accept that germ theory of disease that there's microscopic uh, sized creatures that can infect our bodies and cause us to die and so when we go into any type of surgery uh, they want to make sure that the room is scrubbed down and clean so that we don't bring bacteria, we don't bring harmful stuff you know, with us on our tools or on our hands uh, before we operate on these people. Scientists make mistakes just like everyone else and when they do make a mistake it can be a hard thing, it can be a difficult thing for them to change their mind and say well we thought it was this way we were wrong and now we understand that it is this way. Just like it's hard for all of us to change our minds about something that we thought was true. Now I'm I am indoctrinated into the realm of, of uh, the germ theory of disease. I mean, you're going to have to produce really, really powerful evidence if you're going to ask me to stop believing that germs are, are out there and harmful and can, in fact, kill us. You're going to have to give me some really, really powerful proof. And it's fair that when we look at the doctors in Samuel day, that, well, we look at them and we say, you know, they, they didn't, that theory had never been proven. It had never been outlined for any of them. And to ask them simply to begin to believe quickly and immediately is, it's not fair. That's a, that's a tough thing to do. If you're going to try to convince me um, <clears throat> that gremlins, uh, or when I shoot a game of pool, that the pool balls don't actually hit each other, that in fact gremlins jump out of one pool ball and you know punch the next pool ball and that's what causes it to move I mean you're you're gonna have to bring some really really powerful evidence in order to prove that and so in, a, in the past and in the future and now we have to allow that scientists make mistakes it's hard for them to change their minds just like it's hard for any and all of us to change our minds and there's something called ideological immunity and what that means is that the longer you're taught, the longer you're trained in a specific type of uh, ideas, the longer a scientist works under this idea of, you know, of germs don't exist, 
the harder it is for them to change their mind. Imagine today if one of our doctors was going to try to posit a new theory that was not germs. They're going to have to really show, it's going to take tremendous evidence, and even if they do bring tremendous evidence for the non-existence of germs, a lot of doctors still aren't going to be able to stop believing in germs because they've been taught germs for so long that they're immune to other ideas, hence ideological immunity. They're immune to other ideas because the longer you're indoctrinated into one idea, the harder it is to get out of it. And that's why at the beginning of the semester, I was telling you, it's really, really hard to change your mind. And so that's going to be true of scientists as well, just like it's true of all the rest of us. It's going to be true for scientists. The longer they're taught something in the realm of science, the harder it is for them to say, no, that's not right. It's this thing over here. That's just human. Uh, we have to let them do it, uh, just like we have to let ourselves make that same mistake and, and, and try to be aware that, of that ideological immunity so that you can be prepared to change your mind. If someone comes along and proves the non-existence of germs, we should be able to accept their evidence. Or if someone comes along and proves that gremlins do pop out of you know, pool balls, we should somehow be able to change our minds because here's the evidence in front of us. Um, it's a it, would, it is a difficult thing to do, to change your mind, and that's why scientists are no different than any of the rest of us. It's hard for them as well. In science, a couple things that uh, scientists have to be careful about. Scientists have to be careful because the observer can change the observed. Now, what does that mean? Um, if we're studying a group of uh, baboons, uh, we have to go in without the baboons knowing that we're there. If, if the baboons know that, they, that we're there, they're going to change their behavior. Um, if we're going to study you know, children um, and the psychology of children at play, you know, maybe we have to let children play with children without them knowing that we're there and watching them. Otherwise, their behavior is going to change. When we study indigenous tribes, uh, we have to go in and study them in such a way, if, if we really want to know uh, what their culture and their society and their uh, technology and you know, tools or weapons, if we want to keep those things pure so that we can study, study them, uh, we have to understand that our presence is going to influence uh, those indigenous tribes. And so I've got a photograph um, of uh, some indigenous tribes members who are dressed up in their kind of traditional garb where they've got these... Um, they're, they've got their hunting weapons with them, and they've got like armbands, uh, and they've got headbands, and there's some kind of uh, plant stems that are, you know, in those, and they've got uh, a bag around their neck. I assume that those are some kind of hunting talisman of some sort, whether it's luck or protection or whatever it might be. Um, they're about to go out and do a traditional hunt. They're also, you know, they have their faces painted. But the trouble with this is, is that as you're looking at them, you begin to see immediately that the observer is changing the person that's being observed. And so, in this case, they're both wearing mesh shorts, like basketball shorts. They didn't make those. That's not part of their manufacturing culture. They don't have the kind of manufacturing culture that comes up with mesh shorts. Uh, one of them's wearing a wool cap. One of them's wearing um, like a, um, a synthetic belt around his, kind of around his chest, around his upper stomach, um, something like a fanny pack. You know, but all I can see is the strap, so I don't know what kind of thing he's got strapped to the back of himself there. Um, and the one of them's wearing a pair of Oakleys. Uh, I mean, we, we've radically changed the person, that, that tribe that we were trying to observe. And in the background, you can see three or four automobiles that are parked back there. Uh, this is not, you know, this is not uh, scientists studying these individuals and their native habitat at all. So. You have to be careful as a scientist. The observer can change the observed. And if you want to uh, see them in their natural habitat, you have to make sure that they're not you know, realizing that you're there, like with the baboons. Um, oh, Equipment can also uh, influence the results of a scientist. And so, in particular, <clears throat> um, one of the things that comes to mind <clears throat> if you're trying to study the stars, uh, your telescope is certainly going to influence your ability to study the stars. And so 
uh, if you look at a telescope from the 1700s and you look at Hubble's space telescope now, uh, you're going to get incredibly different results. There's no way that their telescope back then and ours is going to uh, give us the same results. We're just going to have better photographs of uh, the universe um, from the from Hubble. Um, and later generations, hopefully, you know, we'll have uh, a, even better telescopes than Hubble. Maybe we'll instead of just getting one that's you know off planet like Hubble, maybe we'll get one uh, out past Pluto and have one sitting on the edge of our solar system, which is going to give us even better photographs than the one that we've got now. Your equipment uh, is going to limit the kind of scientific research you can do and the scientific results that you can come up with. As we get better equipment, we'll get better results. Uh, it would be incredibly foolish of us you know, in today's time to believe that our equipment is the best equipment that can be made. It might be the best equipment that is on this planet currently, but that doesn't mean that there isn't better uh, equipment coming later on and that we won't invent something new that will allow us to, uh, to get a better picture of the universe. The development of rockets is what allowed Hubble telescope to be launched and to, to now orbit our planet so we get these new uh, fantastic photographs of our universe, but it would be foolish to think that we have reached the height of our technological, uh, the height of technological advancement so that no other telescope could ever do better uh, and therefore all of our scientific observations must now be correct because we have the greatest telescope that can be invented. That's certainly not the case and so we want to be careful. Uh, not to think of ourselves as being so technologically advanced that there's nowhere else to go. Now, I can't imagine where the next step is because I don't have that kind of um, ability. I just don't have the imagination or the scientific know-how to somehow get us from where we are currently to some greater um, scientific piece of equipment. But it would be foolish to think that later generations aren't going to have better technology. Look at the 60s and the 70s and the phones. Uh, the phone systems that we had then and try to tell me that, you know, ours aren't superior. Absolutely they are. Uh, and in another 50 years, guess what? Uh, it'll probably be vastly superior to what we have now, which, you know, if you really think about your phone, maybe isn't as complicated as, you know, think about how many things don't go well and how, uh, how often your phone does not function. At least mine doesn't. Uh, and so, yeah, better equipment, sure. Better phone, yeah. Hope, hopefully somebody will come up with that in the next five minutes and I'll be able to buy one uh, in a few months. Um, and so, yeah, we need to be uh, kind of keep a good perspective on just where we are technologically. When it comes to science, um, like everything else, so not picking on scientists or science in this case, just it's, it's true of all things, um, there's also going to be something called a conflict of interest. Now, uh, the doctor friend that I was talking about with uh, the breastfeeding versus bottle feeding, she and I were talking about the philosophy of science and she was explaining to me um, this uh, conflict of interest and, and what she did is she said that uh, she showed me a little cartoon <coughs> of, um, of a, a businessman walking into a scientist's lab and handing him something called a, a NIM grant, N-I-M, NIM uh, grant. And, the businessman was looking at the scientist. He's a pharmaceutical um, uh, sale, uh, businessman. He's a, somebody who owns pharmaceutical that is involved with pharmaceutical sales. He's handing the scientist a grant. He's saying, look, we'll give you this money, but here are the conclusions we want you to come to about our drug. And so this kind of conflict of interest is also involved in science. Now, the scientist needs the money to continue to operate his lab, but the money's coming from somebody who's saying you have to have come to these results with, when it's concerned with our, pharmaceutical, or when our, with our pharmaceutical company, with the drug that we're trying to sell. Here are the results we want you to come to. And I remember kind of looking at my doctor friend, and I'm like, damn, people really do this? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah. So there is that conflict of interest. The scientist, the doctor who wants to give only good medicine to people who, um, who you know, it's going to help them, it's going to benefit them at the same time in order to keep their lab running, you know, maybe they're falsifying because they have to, 
some of those results. But yes, I mean that kind of conflict of interest takes place. Is it money driven? Yes, I and mean, that's just kind of the way the world works. And we should understand that um, the scientists have to sometimes do that as well. I mean that's part of it. That's um, that conflict of interest within science. As I said, science is pure, but scientists aren't necessarily. They're human, just like all the rest of us. And no, uh, no area of study is pure. Philosophy, philosophy isn't pure. Uh, there's plenty of people in there who are misleading the other people who are doing, um, who are being uh, not not fully giving all the information. They're not being forthcoming. That's the word. They're not being forthcoming in philosophy, uh, and they're trying to persuade people to think in a certain way. I mean, it's just in all areas of study, and so we have to be cautious and, and make sure that we're aware that, again, science is pure, but scientists necessarily aren't. Um, in science, there's also bias, and when it comes to this, uh, to, to that kind of personal bias, sometimes in science, um, scientists are portrayed uh, as being just those people who are influenced by the facts. They're just, let the scientific knowledge come to us. Uh, we don't care what it is. We'll follow the information wherever it leads. A lot of times scientists are portrayed that way, and some scientists are that way. Sometimes, sci some scientists are not. And so when it comes to uh, bias, um, scientists are just as vulnerable to a personal bias as everyone else. Just like, remember, with ideological immunity, the more you know about something, the harder it is to change your mind. Or perhaps you come into a science lab with a, a particular bias, with an agenda. You're trying to get dot, dot, dot to happen or to, to be believed because of whatever reason. Uh, and so scientists aren't pure uh, any more than the rest of us are. All right. So scientists aren't pure any more than the rest of us are pure. They're also uh, prone to personal bias. And I've, I've, I remember watching, uh, I, I like to watch um, all kinds of different science documentaries, but I was watching one time on the um, how the universe formed and kind of in the series as it was formed, they started talking about the formation of our solar system and then they started talking about the extinction of the dinosaurs and how that came about. And there was one theory that one scientist put forward called uh, the nemesis theory, and basically um, the theory is that our sun, our sun's a star, uh, that our sun shares an orbit with another star, and every 26 million years, these two stars come into close contact with each other, and that nemesis, it's also called the death star, if you're more familiar with that, you know, that Star Wars reference, but literally in this case they call it the death star, uh, that when these two stars got close enough to each other, that Nemesis would throw all kinds of debris in our direction, and that's what happened. That's what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, was it threw debris at us, so this huge you know, amounts of debris hit our planet and devastated it, and so the dinosaurs died out, uh, and the ecosystem as we know it today began to, to grow and form. So what they did is they kind of figured out when the extinction of the dinosaurs was, they understood that, and don't ask for me for the science, I can't do the science, this is just the theory. I, I know the theory, I don't know the why behind the theory. And so what they started doing is they were like, okay, if this happened to the dinosaurs at this point, then Nemesis, that Death Star, should be about here, you know, in that rotation. And so what they did is they got a system, a computer system, uh, a telescope computer system called 2MASS, as in the number 2, 2MASS, and they uh, started taking photographs of where that star should be. And so they start, start trying to, to map it, to, to take photographs at the universe, because they can track how the stars are moving. If they can find this thing that's out there that's obviously not part of another galaxy or another system or whatever, they can track the Death Star. Again, I can't explain exactly how it happens. I don't know the science. I just know that they're taking pictures. They're saying it should be over here, and we should be able to tell because of its motion that it's doing dot, dot, dot. They took uh, two million images. No evidence of the Death Star was ever found. And so <clears throat> most or many of scientists uh, concluded that no such star exists. Why not? They don't have any evidence. Since they don't have any evidence for the existence of this ne Death Star, Nemesis, uh, they concluded that it doesn't exist. Um, one scientist, though, on the documentary refused to give up. He continues to believe 
in the existence of Nemesis, and here's what he said. He said, there's lots of stars out there, there are millions of them, but when you find a needle in a haystack, you look at it and say, that's not hay. Similar with this, when we find Nemesis, we will measure the orbit and we'll prove that it's Nemesis. Now, in this case, you've got a scientist who doesn't have any evidence for the existence of this, the Nemesis star, but he continues to believe anyway. Why? Uh, there's some kind of bias in there. He wants to believe that this particular thing is true. We don't have any evidence for the truth, for the, for the existence of this particular thing, but that's what he wants to believe. And so he, he continues to believe it. Absence of truth, or absence of uh, evidence, he continues to believe in the existence of Nemesis. Is he wrong? I don't know. I don't know. We don't have any evidence. But, again, a scientist believing in something without evidence, I mean, that's not science in this case. It's a kind of a bias. Uh, <clears throat> so we have to be careful and realize that scientists are human just like the rest of us, uh, and we all make mistakes. And so we have to let them make mistakes as well. Once you're convinced of something, it can be very, very difficult to change your mind. I understand that. I actually have changed my mind about a couple of very, very uh, important issues in my life, some things that I thought were true. It's hard. It's really, really difficult to do, and um, <clears throat> I'm still working on my ideas today. I'm not 100% settled. I don't think I know everything. I don't think my ideas are absolutely perfectly correct. Um, hopefully, I'm making progress, and you know, in the end, I'm not sure I'll ever decide fully and completely. Uh, but, <clears throat> again, it's hard to change your mind. I know exactly what that's like. Okay. All right, just a couple things about science uh, quickly. <clears throat> and this is more, not now not geared toward or science or scientists, but more really geared toward um, us. <clears throat> when I said us, I kind of made the assumption that we're non-scientists. Bad assumption. That's not necessarily accurate. Some of you may be studying to go into science or even already be scientists. Um, but <clears throat> some of the things that kind of influence people who are non-scientists uh, sometimes that we should be aware of and be careful of. Uh, first of all, anecdotal evidence uh, is not science. In fact, it's really not uh, even evidence. <clears throat> so one thing that <clears throat> my doctor friend said that she couldn't stand, she got tired of hearing was that um, uh, she got tired of hearing people say, I went and got a flu shot and then I got the flu. Don't get a flu shot because it'll give you the flu. Um, that is, a, that's based on some ignorance. It's based on anecdotal evidence, those stories that are told over and over and over. <clears throat> it is true that if you get a flu shot, you may suffer some flu symptoms, but the flu shot won't give you the flu. Uh, as it turns out, there are two different strands of the flu virus, A and B, and we can inoculate you against one, but not the other. And so, if you're inoculated against one, you may still get the other flu, uh, the other flu virus that we can't inoculate you against. But that flu shot did not give you the flu. It's that we can protect you against one. We can't protect you against another. So it's not the flu shot that gives you the flu. But those kind of anecdotal evidence, that kind of the stories, they take over and, and people begin to think of them as <clears throat> being science. Uh, another example kind of like that, this is a letter that was written from uh, one sister to another. It said, you may find this interesting. Mom, Dad, and Carrie are in, a Mont are in Montana at the Mary Widow Mine. It's a radon mine. They have been there a week. They go three to four times a day and they sit there for an hour. They're all feel feeling better than they have in years. Carrie has no neck pain and I don't remember a time when she hasn't had neck pain. <clears throat> now, these individuals, they go to a radon mine, they sit there for several hours a day, and they're convinced that that's what's removing the pain from their body. All right, another interruption there. Sorry, um, I'm monitoring a couple of phones as I deliver these lectures, and sometimes I just have to hit pause there. Um, all right, so we were in the um, we were in the radon mine. You know, these people are sitting there. They they can't remember a time uh, when they didn't have pain. Um, now th these types of stories, again, they're kind of anecdotal, meaning that uh, you know, people go into these mines, can we prove scientifically that it's the radon mine that's causing them to no longer feel pain? Um, there's no scientific evidence that that's what's happening. In fact, it could be a placebo effect where 
they believe going into it that they won't have pain and so that when they sit there uh, and then they come out they don't have pain why not because they believe that they wouldn't um, so I had some shoulder trouble and I started taking um, I can't remember what it was called now I started glucosamine I started taking glucosamine years ago my shoulder stopped hurting I did the scientific research can we prove glucosamine is what causes you know that that particular type of joint pain you know to go away no we can't uh, guess what I did I kept right on taking my glucosamine because I didn't care if it was in my mind or in that pill I mean, my shoulder did not hurt um, but there isn't a way to prove scientifically that you know this is uh, what's happening but lots of people believe in it uh, and so perhaps it helps them and it may just be in their mind it may have nothing to do with science but you have to be careful about that kind of anecdotal evidence um, if you remember there used to be like a copper um, uh, bracelet that was really really popular and it was said to help with joint pain um, again that's all anecdotal we can't prove that scientifically so you have to be careful to make sure that you're not being taken by some type of um, you know charlatans um, by people who are just trying to make money and lying uh, a couple of other things about science really quickly <clears throat> a lot of times you'll see in commercials uh, they'll appeal to something as being natural and therefore it's good for you just because something's natural it doesn't mean it's good for you uh, I have a picture here of uh, death caps. They're a particular kind of mushroom. Hopefully, we all know don't eat, uh, you know, mushrooms that grow out in the wild because they very well might be poisonous. They're natural. Poisonous mushrooms are perfectly natural, but that doesn't mean they're good for you. So, in a commercial, if somebody's appealing to, it's all natural. Well, that might not mean it's good. It just means that it's natural. It just means it comes from nature. It's not man-made. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it's good. You have to be kind of careful of that. Um, appeal to celebrity is not science either. Uh, I have a picture here of uh, Jennifer Aniston, and she appears to be uh, basically nude. Now she's got her her legs kind of crossed up and her arms crossed up so that you, you can't see anything uh, of the nudity, but um, kind of as the background, as the, what's enveloping her is the, uh, the, the background of the smart bottle water and she's holding a bottle of smart water and the implication here is uh, drink smart water and you will look like uh, Jennifer Aniston I mean that's not science and I'm kind of glad it's not science and when I saw that because because I know about this kind of um, the philosophy of advertising and psychology and advertising I know about that instead of me going oh look at that you know if I drank smart water you know I I might have you know this instead my what I saw what I saw was oh I better not drink smart water because if I do I might wind up looking like, looking like Jennifer Aniston and that's going to be a really bad thing you know for me uh, I don't want to look like her uh, I want to look like you know me and so I just was like well no smart water for me because if I drink that I might look like her and that's not going to be good so just because a celebrity uh, advertises something uh, it doesn't mean that it necessarily works or is good. I think we all know that, but it's easy to fall victim to that if the right celebrity does it. It can appeal to, uh, it can appeal to us. Um, scientific language does not constitute science either. Here I've got a picture of a scientist um, <clears throat> who is talking about uh, this thing called pH ion. And he says in the advertisement, it removes acids, microforms, toxins by virtue of its negative ionic char uh, charge. And the doctor, uh, you know, he's a good-looking younger man you know, with all of his hair, and, you know, he's thin, and, you know, he's not this balding, fat old guy or, you know, whatever. It's a young, attractive, intelligent-looking fellow who's using scientific language, and it makes it look like uh, what he's advertising here really is something scientific that would help you with your health. So the doctor that I'm consulting with as I'm talking about philosophy of science, she said uh, one of the things that they advertised in there is that it removes microforms. And she said, she said, I don't even know what a microform is. I've never heard of that. But it sounds science-y, doesn't it? It sounds like it might be something that you, you know, oh good, it removes acids. Acids are bad. Microforms and toxins. So just because something has scientific language, that doesn't mean it's, mean it's really science. An appeal to ancient wisdom doesn't mean that something is scientifically valid either. Uh, in the ancient world, they used leeches to try to remove bad blood. They would also um, lance you and try to remove bad blood. I always wondered 
why the bad blood came out instead of the good blood. You know, well, they're sick, so just drain some of that bad blood out, and they'll get well. Well, I mean, I mean, if you're just cutting them, you know, somewhere, how do you know the bad blood's coming out and not the good blood? And of course, today we know that you know if you lose a lot of blood, that your body has to build, rebuild it, has to put it back in there. And so sometimes when you're lancing, lancing or leasing, leeching someone, lancing or leeching someone, it's actually doing them more harm than good. We know that today. Um, so just because ideas are old, doesn't mean they're necessarily good or scientific. On the other hand, just because they're old doesn't mean they're bad. And in fact, the ancients did in fact figure out that they could take the bark of a willow tree and they could crush it and then mix it uh, with some liquid. And if you drink it, then it would alleviate minor aches and pains. And so today, we still use that extract of willow bark in aspirin and it still works the same way. And the ancients figured out that if you could do that, if you could, crush that up and then consume it, then it would help you with your aches and pains. So I tell my students today, next time you, you, know, you get a headache or some kind of ache and pain, uh, you know, don't buy, bother buying aspirin, just go out and lick a willow tree and, and you should be good to go. Uh, but remember, just because an idea is ancient uh, doesn't mean it's not scientific, it doesn't mean it doesn't work, it just means that it's old in that particular case. So, um, Science can and does give us a, a lot of, of great things, but science is limited. Um, in this part, I just want to say kind of, kind of quickly here that it does give us tremendous um, benefits. It helps us to, to traverse the world around us. It makes life easier and better and more comfortable, more convenient. Uh, we have more food on the planet now <clears throat> than has ever been had. It's easier to access. Uh, we, we have so many things that are made much better and much easier because of science. I love air conditioning. I was raised without an air conditioner, so i got to tell you uh, that you know, now when it really hot weather gets here, I'm glad that there's some scientists out there who figured out how to create an air conditioner. I think it's tremendous. But science is limited, and in a culture today like ours, a lot of times um, science is just held up as, and this is the ultimate, and science will give us all the answers. Um, I think science gives us lots of answers, but there are some things that science can't touch. There are some things that science can't give us answers to. Uh, one of the things that science can't answer for us is the question of morality. Science can talk to us about pain. Science can talk to us about um, the, the effects of the sociological dot, dot, dot. It can do all of that, but it can't tell us morality. It can't say, and these things are right, and these things are wrong. It's limited to um, the physical world, to the chemistry of our world, to the, the physics of our world, to all of those kinds of sciences, but it can't step over into the metaphysical world where we decide, and these things shouldn't happen. These things ought never to happen. No one should do these things or have these things done to, him, to, done to them. There's no uh, realm of science in the, that physical sciences uh, in which you can make those kinds of declarations. Uh, you can talk about that the sun uh, is the center of our solar system and that knowledge won't help you decide uh, whether or not you should do dot 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 morally. There's, there's no, that's not going to help you. It, doesn't it won't influence, it shouldn't influence. Uh, it can't tell you the right kind of moral decisions to make. Uh, you can talk about lots of different biological and chemical aspects of, uh, of humanity, but those are biological and chemical, and the realm of metaphysics, the realm of ethics, uh, stands over here on its own and is something very, very different. You can't say that racism is wrong based on the anatomy of humanity. It's wrong, but it's wrong for different reasons. It's not wrong because of you know, my human biology is this, therefore racism is wrong. It just won't help us with that. It gives us a lot of stuff, but it, it has its limitations, and we have to be careful that we allow that those limitations are in place. Um, I, I give you this warning partly because I've been watching some scientists recently, uh, and they're very excited, some of them, not all of them, but some of them are very, very excited, saying science is going to give us all the answers 
all we have to do is rely on science and eventually we'll know everything you know, that there is to know, that we need to know, or every bit of knowledge comes back to us through science. We have to be careful with that because, as I say, there are some things that science really can't talk about. And they can talk to us about how the anatomy of the brain might work, but they can't say, and therefore, dot, 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 when it comes to some metaphysical things. We have to be careful with science. Let it do what it does. It does tremendous things for us, uh, but also recognize that it doesn't do some things for us and be cautious of those uh, individuals who might be trying to say, and science is going to give us everything. So a little bit of a warning there toward the end. Just, um, uh, again, with science, great stuff from them. Also, there are limitations, just like there are limitations on all areas of study and research. So we want to be careful that we know the limitations that are there as well. And I will see you all next time. <laughs>